Hello, welcome to Local Anesthetic Podcast, your weekly injection of mind-numbing local news. My name is Alex, and joining me as always on Monday the 8th of February, it's Monday after work, 5pm, um, is Rob. How are you doing there, Rob? Yep, fine. Is it snowing where you are? Because I feel like Jack Torrance. I'm, I'm holed up in, 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 in a cell of my own madness and despair um, with a lot of ice and snow outside. Yeah, it is. Um, it's been it, it was kind of snowing yesterday. It hasn't really settled today. It's, it has. Um, we ventured out. It was very slippy on our road because we had to we had to nip to Sainsbury's. Um, yeah, uh, it, I mean, I, I do enjoy snow at the best times, but, I, but I'm hoping that it'll go before the weekend. Um, obviously, I, we're, I'm moving house. Then uh, the house continues to be an absolute bomb site, and our living room is just full of boxes and various. Different bits and pieces. Alex, I'm tired. I am so tired. <laughs> well, I've heard that um, having a baby um, gives you lots of energy, so you've got that to look forward to, Rob. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just preparing for, you know, sleepless nights for the next maybe three years. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm off the next fortnight as well, but it does. It's obviously not going to feel like a break. And obviously, even when we can go out to go to the new house, because we have now got the keys, um, it still is going literally there and back. Um, and it, it doesn't feel like a break. You know, if I'm off work, but that's it. So, well, hopefully, Rob, this will feel like a break. We have got. I'm, I'm going to call it now a, a, a first rate episode of LA podcast for our listeners today, Rob. This is episode 332. And it's going to be a cracker, Rob, because some of the content I've got, honestly, before we begin, is there any news? Uh, not really, no. There's, um, again, we've had quite a lot of story submissions. There's a few that um, have crossed over with my stories, um, but I don't think there's any real news to report on. No, let's, let's just crack on with the episode. I've got the feeling, Rob, that today might be one of those days where the chance of, we need a name for this phenomena, where you have the same story as me or a listener's chose the same story as me cross what should we call it? A, a cross pollination of ideas i don't know no no that's not right is it a a i i know what you mean though yeah i think there the, 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 there's the, there's going to be um uh some um <laughs> dovetailing dovetailing does that work i don't know alex th- please don't make me use my brain <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right well anyway i feel like the, the possibility of that whatever it is is strong this week but rob i am going to just start with a very quick few updates lovely i would like to update you on the current um the current whereabouts and goings on and vocation of mr alan ames <gasps> seriously yeah because i bothered to go on his linkedin profile so he's not in africa anymore he doesn't mention ever being there he's he's in the U- firmly in the uk so i just Hang wanted on. to tell you what he, what his he job makes no is. reference to being in africa now, he makes a reference to co-founder of Eagle Heights, which he says he co-founded as a bird of prey centre, which now has foundation status. It's a wildlife educational facility is open to the public. Um, conservation work is undertaken both in the UK and West Africa. So he does mention that. Good to know. But what, what I didn't know about him is he has been known officially as, what, uh, <laughs> from March 1996 to the present, which weirdly he says, hang on a minute, this man is mad. So he says from March 1996 to the present, after which he's written 25 years. Now, 1996 to now is not... Yeah, oh, it Alex, is. Alex, it is 25 Fucking years. Uh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> Who's the mad one now, Alan? Alex, we have to face the inevitable. We are getting old. Yes, the 90s, the 90s were two decades ago, almost three. I would have really liked to have known you in the 90s, Rob, because we could have um, hung out, watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, played on our Game Boys, and... Um, I don't know. Maybe you know, talked about girls we fancy. I mean, Alex, we could do that now. <laughs> okay, let's set it up. Yeah, lovely, uh, Rob. So he he his official title is School Birdman. Uh, Sorry, or he likes on. to call him. Th- he likes to call himself Birdman for short as well. By the way, School Birdman sounds like a man who's lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he lives in a shopping trolley. You know, he wears a dirty overall and maybe keeps a pigeon in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too far off. He describes this as 
inspirational, educational, covering a wide range of subjects, including life processes, living things, sustainability, adaption, flight, camouflage, population dynamics, natural history, predator-prey relationships, food chains, habitat destruction and pollution. Years of experience and fascinating stories bring this to life. Credentials include best assembly we've ever seen, in quotes, and extremely engaging for both children and adults. I mean, Alex, let's, let's be fair to him. The best assembly we've ever seen. So that's what he does, Robbie. He goes around schools with a bird and gives assemblies, and they know him as Birdman. I can imagine, though, he would put on a very entertaining show. Could you? I think I would have liked to see him at a school assembly. As he, you know, he, he reveals a falcon, then pulls out a shotgun and blows it clean out of the air. That kind of thing. <laughs> Right, let's let's move on. So if anybody wants to know what Alan Ames is doing, and if you want to know why we're even talking about Alan Ames, I believe it's episode five, twelve. Yes. How, how many years ago was that now, Rob? Eight years ago, something like that? Uh, that was, I think that was 2012. So judging by your maths, you know, two or three years ago. Right, yeah. Uh, episode five, From the Valley to the Abyss, second half of that, you can hear all about the wonderful world of Alan Ames, and it really is worth your time. Also, I don't think we've ever laughed as much as we have on any podcast as we have on that one. Um, I, no, I agree, but I, I do think, by the way, if you haven't listened to it, the, uh, the, the conversation last week about Thatcher and the coal mines, I mean, the, <laughs> it shouldn't have been funny, but it fucking was. <laughs> I enjoyed that immensely. Now, talking about that, Rob, I made a reference in Daft Talk to... Francis Maud in 2012 when there was a fuel shortage his way of telling people to deal with this potential lack of fuel was just to put a put a bit of fuel in a jerry can and store some in your garage of course and he got in a lot of trouble for it as I remember a woman got very very nasty burns whilst trying to decant petrol in her kitchen um, that happened Rob it, it's out there for all to see but I just okay. wanted to tell you about another story that came out at around the time it was the 3rd of April 2012 shortly after he made these comments from the Telegraph Francis Maud killed my dog with reckless jerry can comments, claims owner. <laughs> right. D- did did he or did did your misadventure kill that dog? Well, can I just say no well neither, but can I just say, Rob, that you said did Francis Maud kill a dog? There is history of this, isn't there? Because do you remember when I read out that fantastic story about Michael Esseltine? Uh, yeah, he talks yeah. about where he deliberately killed the dog, didn't he throttle it? And he did it that was it because it was becoming aggressive with his wife. Wasn't that right? And he just That's killed right. it with his bare hands. This was, and this was in a house. Yeah, wasn't this in his autobiography? I seem to remember that he he felt that this this anecdote <laughs> was was suitable for the general public. Apparently, uh, I might have to find that again. <laughs> anyway, this is the story. Lisa Stepto. Um, Great name. No relation. Lisa Stepto. No relation. No relation, <laughs> no relation to Stepto and Son. Forty four was left devastated when her ten year old Jack Russell Stanley was mown down by panic buyers rushing to the petrol station opposite her house. Right, so in no way was the, did Francis Maud actually deliberately cause the act yes, of he, her dog dying. The pet was knocked down as queues mounted outside the Morrison's petrol station in Welling Garden City, Hertfordshire, last Thursday. Shoppers blocked from getting into the supermarket car park by traffic jams were forced to the park on the road, blocking other drivers' views. Miss Stepto said she noticed heavy the normal traffic thundering along her road just moments before her pet escaped. And nobody stopped after her dog was locked down. She was blocked, Rob, from reaching her dying pet by motorists who ignored her cries for help because they were more interested, Rob, in getting their petrol because Francis Moore told them to rush out and fill up their jerry cans with petrol. And she says, I think the comment about jerry cans was very irresponsible. In today's society, people are not practical enough to know how to store things like petrol, so it's irresponsible to make people panic like that. I feel like Francis Maud has killed my dog. <laughs> And it, by the way, she also adds, Rob, it could have been a child. It could have been a child. That's, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't disagree with that. So just if anybody was interested in that period in our history, I, have just, I just wanted to tell you about that because I found it um, very illuminating. Right, Rob, another quick, uh, well, not, not really an update. I just want just a brief mention. Um, independent. I mean, I love the headline. It, obviously, it was covered everywhere, but... Elon Musk says he has, in quotes, totally happy monkey with brain chip so it can play video games using its mind. How did I miss this story? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Elon Musk has revealed that his Neuralink startup has implanted a wireless chip into a monkey's brain in order to allow it to play video games. No, hang right. on. No, he hasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has. There's He's absolutely been no this way this happened. <laughs> it has. He's been working on this for ages. Elon Musk is like something out of The Simpsons or Futurama. I mean, if ever there was a definite... I mean, he is a living embodiment of crazy scientists. I keep having to watch these SpaceX 
um, tests go up, which inevitably end in the rocket. Just fail each time. Ball, yeah. Not just fail, but end in a, a ball, a, a, an inferno ball of fire, Rob. Um, I would, don't ever want to be getting on any of those things, having seen the first test flights. But the trouble is, right, because obviously this, I think he, was, he is a now, now officially the world's richest man, even before Jeff Bezos, which is incredible. I think, he, I mean, surely he's, he's got to the point now where you just lose your mind because there's nothing left for you to do. And so you're just finding things to occupy your time. Well, the interesting thing is, Rob, is that he is... I've seen him give talks before where he's very, very worried about the advance of AI. And I thought, great, brilliant to have somebody in such a position of power wanting to do something like this. But his answer to this is, it's going to happen anyway. So if you can't beat them, join them. And basically, we all need to become symbionts with machines and just upskill ourselves and become half cyborg. And that's the way to conquer this particular problem. And I'm like, oh, my fucking God, no, that isn't the answer. <laughs> that's not better. <laughs> if, if, I mean, if nothing else, he's creating a Dalek. Right, Rob. Well, anyway, the technology billionaire the who also heads space. <laughs> yeah, Just to say, take take your pick. The technology billionaire who also heads SpaceX and Tesla said the monkey, in quotes, looks totally happy, and that Neuralink's facilities meet U.S. regulatory requirements. Speaking during a Q and A session on the Clubhouse app, Mr. Musk said the startup had moved beyond experiments and onto pigs and monkeys. So this is his quote. We've already got, like, a monkey with a wireless implant in their skull and tiny wires who can play video games using his mind, and he looks totally happy. He does not look like an unhappy monkey. You can't even see where the neural implant was put in. He's not uncomfortable. He doesn't look weird. Alex, why he have also I said, this? Hang on, Rob. He also said that Neuralink's laboratory has, in quotes, the nicest monkey facilities <laughs> that, the inspe- that the inspectors had ever seen. There are some times when Musk talks that it sounds like Trump yeah that, yeah good point um also are you telling me there's someone oh, i suppose there is someone probably you know related to the government in some way who goes around inspecting monkey conditions which kind of makes sense but i i, I, I don't know why i've got this image of musk just sitting around on his in his enormous house on his sofa just surrounded by animals who you know maybe the monkey sitting next to him playing on playing on the xbox with him as he you know as he blazes away and there's a pig maybe slightly deformed because you know he's, he's had a computer to in, implanted in his brain alex this is really concerning don't forget the one giving him a hand shandy right Fair enough. i don't take that back either um can i just say the nicest monkey facilities the u.s department of agriculture has ever seen is a very good episode title it, it really is it's yeah it's it really is <laughs> To continue his quote, he says, we went the extra mile for the monkeys. One of the things we're trying to figure out is, can we have the monkeys playing mind pong with each other? That would be pretty cool. And Rob, this feeds into what you're talking about. When you've got nothing better to do than try and you've got nothing else in life to stimulate you other than thinking, why don't we put computer chips into monkeys' minds and get them to play mind pong with each other? That would be pretty cool. That's the best thing that's left in your imagination or for the writing team of The Simpsons, not to enact in real life. This is a man who people do not say no to anymore. I mean, this is the man also who also fired a car into space. For what reason? We have no idea, but he did it anyway. In the short term, Rob Neuralink plans to use its wireless chips to treat brain disorders and diseases, but longer term goals for the startup are more ambitious, ranging from human AI symbiosis, great, to something the CF- CEO refers to as conceptual telepathy. This would involve humans thinking about a complex series of concepts and then transferring them directly uncompressed to another person, and Mr. Musk says this would massively improve the quality of communication and the speed of it. Rob, no, I now believe he's a psychopath. <laughs> he's a psychopath. There are some Sorry. pretty wild things that could be done, he said. You could probably save state in the brain. So if you were to die, your state could be returned in the form of another human body or robot body. You could decide if you want to be a robot or a person or whatever. When are we going to stop these people, Rob? This is the, this is the kind of thing... Rob, I watched Silence of the Lambs at the weekend. Mm. Um because i wanted to see it again this is this is nuts alex i don't know what you're worrying about okay i mean i can't think there'll be anything that goes wrong placing computer chips into into flawed human beings for them to then to apparently pass those concerns and all their anxieties and all their their you know their worries and their stresses onto other human beings what could possibly go wrong rob i'm terrified y- yes but alex there's, the thing you have to remember is by the time you, you really have time to process it, we'll all be dead anyway, so... Yeah, but then I might be woken up in a new body with my mind uploaded to it. Good point. Rob, before I continue, you have not commented on my hair. 
you've dyed it. Oh, cut it. You've cut it. Yeah, uh, it's um, very nice, Alex. No, but what do you think, honestly? I, I hadn't noticed, to be honest. Um, I think you've done it. If you, did you do it yourself? I did. Uh, it, it, it's uh, very nice. Yeah, I think you've done this. It looked quite even. Um, yeah, I, I, I must admit that mine is getting very long and it's really quite upsetting. I don't know. It's amazing what a small luxury a haircut really is and something you really take for granted. I I don't think you're giving me enough credit. I think this is a damn good haircut for an at-home job. Yeah. Have you... you, uh, Was it layered? It looks like you've just... It's just a a pure cut there. What do you mean? Uh, uh, It looks like you just shaved the sides. Is that right? No, 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 no. The top as well has been done. And the back is back. Okay, yeah, I, I, I yeah, it, it, it's very nice, Alex. Um, didn't expect to have this this conversation on the podcast, but why, why the hell not? <laughs> right, Rob. Uh, well, I don't feel I'm getting enough um, complimentary feedback from you, and that's fine. But Rob, now we will have all heard the story this week. So it's it's it, look. I felt this week like a quintessential, a quintessentially local anaesthetic themed story, really did take over the news already it would have been a story we would have covered, which is the story about the bin man who lost his job kicking the head of a three-year-old boy snowman. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I heard it covered extensively on so many radio stations. James O'Brien covered it for a, a two-hour segment or whatever. Um, so it's, uh, if you don't know about it, go off and look at, look at it. But that's the kind of story, Rob, we would have broken in the past, you know? But that's fine. But because I went to the Hereford Times to see the original story, I came across this story by James Thomas on the 7th of February. Would you like to hear the headline? Go on. I think this has to be a paper that I look at quite regularly from now on. Pervert gel for rubbing courgette through leggings in Hereford. (laughs) Brilliant. Okay. Now, this man looks like sort of a a, a sort of Phil Mitchell type character, but with grey hair, and his head really is the shape and the colour of a tomato. Was, um, hang on, was he wearing the leggings at the time? We, you shall find out. Okay. A pervert who shoved a courgette down the front of the leggings he was wearing before parading in front of shoppers in Hereford has been jailed. Alex, look, this is, this is the problem with society at the moment. That's obviously a bit of harmless fun. He, he was just pretending he was, he obviously was probably a lot better endowed than he was and was just, you know, trying to lighten the mood. Well, uh, he was spotted in Hightown by horrified and disgusted shoppers, including parents with their children, on a Saturday afternoon in the run-up to Christmas. He stood simulating a sex act, Rob, for more than an hour before he was arrested by police. Right. Could could you not have just said that beforehand? Um, Then I wouldn't have implied that it was a bit of harmless fun. (laughs) An hour? Wouldn't you get bored of this jape after about ten minutes? An hour? Rubbing a courgette in the leggings you're wearing. Alex, I don't think this man has a lot to do. <laughs> I'll be honest. I may be wrong. Kathleen Orchard, which is a beautiful name, prosecuting, told Hereford Crown Court on Friday that Chambers had a long history of indecent exposures, which had resulted in prison time and sexual harm prevention orders, but none of them seemed to be a deterrent. So, Rob, it was at 12.30pm in Hightown on Saturday, December the 12th, when Chambers was spotted leaning against the market stall pole by an off-duty police officer. He was wearing a coat, tight leggings and a face mask, The police officer's wife said she could see a large long item through the leggings, which Chambers kept touching. He kept trying to make eye contact with the officer's wife, as well as other women in the city centre, with lots of distressed shoppers also noticing Chambers. One witness who was shopping with her 14-year-old daughter said she felt sick and immediately went home. Chambers, who had only just been released from prison two months before the offence, then started parading himself. Police turned up around an hour later to arrest him. He then removed the courgette, which was tied around his waist with a string. When officers searched his car, Great. Rob. When officers searched his car, they found more courgettes. Magnificent, absolutely magnificent. So, do you think he? Um, do you think he, he tended to repeat this? Maybe, maybe he was doing it for Christmas. Well, defence barrister Emily Hegerden said since the release of, from prison in October 2020, he had rekindled the relationship he had with his daughter, who Miss Hegerden said was in court and supporting her father. Miss Hegerden said wow. that in a police interview. Chambers admitted the act was something which he thought would, in quotes, help him out of a low mood. <laughs> I mean, just, just imagine, right, yeah, that you'd, you'd rekindled your relationship with your long-lost daughter. Uh, <laughs> on the run-up to Christmas, you thought, oh, that's fantastic. We can, we can share our first Christmas together in a long time. And then the next thing he says, I'm really sorry, darling. I've got to go to court. court. There was a, a small misunderstanding involving a courgette. Would you like to come and support me? 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. A small misunderstanding involving a courgette is the episode title. Well done, Rob. <laughs> Absolutely <Thank you>. brilliant. <laughs> Right, Rob, let's talk about Brexit and coronavirus in two separate stories. One is from The Guardian, The Traitorous Guardian. Rob, it's a story about bees. Right. Obviously, I said that there's a picture I sent you yesterday which I feel I have to mention because uh, for those who don't know, Snickers have changed the name back, back to Marathon. Now, have they actually or is it just a promotional thing? I don't think it's permanent. No, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's promotional. Um, but why? For what reason? Who cares? Why do you think? Is it because we're independent now and we can do it, whereas before the EU were forcing us to call it Snickers? I don't think they were. I reckon there, there was a letter-writing campaign by a lot of angry gammon, um, and they just, gave in to, uh, they just gave in to it. What do you think of the term gammon? Would you not say it's very derogatory and actually quite discriminatory in and of itself? Because who's it meant to describe? Uh, yeah, no, I, I do think it is, and that's why I tend to use it. Uh, it's fat white men, usually in their <laughs> late 50s. Okay, anyway, right, Rob, be, be, let's talk about bees. Um, this is a story by, uh, well, I don't know who it's by, 2nd of February. Brexit rules mean 15 million baby bees may have to be seized and burned, says beekeeper. <laughs> why? F- for fun. Right. <laughs> It's, I'll tell you why, Rob, because the EU are vindictive and th- th- they're vindictive, Rob. They're like, a, they're like a, a jilted lover who has nothing better to do than go around burning bees, pet bees. I, w- I went to Subway today and they legitimately had a sign on their, um, by their salad Subway. bar saying, Subway, yeah, um, that basically said, um, we apologise, some of our fresh produce may not be, what was it? I think because of Brexit, some of our fresh produce may not be available. So that, so, but is, is that because of, I, I'm assuming that's because of uh, the stockades at Dover. Is that, I, 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 it, just, it just took me by surprise. It's the first time I've ever seen it mentioned anywhere. Uh, oh yeah. Apparently there's massive problems going on with imports and exports and yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. But anyway. Anyway. Great. Brexit. A beekeeper yeah. trying to bring 15 million bees into the UK says he's been told they may be seized and burned because of post-Brexit laws. Patrick Murphy wants to import the baby Italian bees for his Kent business to help farmers pollinate valuable crops. But new laws that came into effect after the UK left the single market mean that bringing bees into the country is banned. Since the end of the transition period, only queen bees can be imported into Great Britain rather than colonies and packages of bees. However, confusion over whether bees can be brought in via Northern Ireland has caused a legal headache. The Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, otherwise known as DEFRA, said it was aware of the issue and is working with the devolved administrations to find a solution. I'm a passionate beekeeper. I've been doing it for nearly 20 years, Murphy said. He's managing director of Bee Equipment, very uh, imaginatively named, based near (laughs) Canterbury. And every year he imports large numbers of bees from breeders in Italy where the climate is warmer. The ban could put all the work he does in jeopardy, Mr. Murphy said. It's a monumentally stupid situation for a country supposed to be standing on its own two feet and exporting around the world. In an effort to avoid the import ban and abide by the new laws, Murphy arranged for his usual importation of 15 million bees to arrive, Rob, via Northern Ireland in April, but said he'd been told they may be destroyed if he tries this. So they've said, no, you can't try and circumvent it like this. If you do that, we'll seize them and we'll burn them. And I think the burning bit is like a sort of EU sacrifice. That makes sense. I mean, it it just, Alex, to me, this makes sense because we only want the brightest, the best bees coming to the UK. And if they have to qualify on a points-based system, whereby obviously the, the queen is, is obviously the top of that, that, that pyramid, uh, then that makes sense. You know, we, we don't want your, your, your run-of-the-mill, uneducated, um, unskilled bees coming to the UK. I totally agree with you, Rob. And um, my question is, and um, that's the end of that story. My question is, Rob, um, why is this man importing or wanting to import 15 million bees? Can I give you my theory? <laughs> Can I, before you do, um, is there going to be a sexual element to it? Yes. Right, go ahead. I think, Rob, that this man for a very long time has dream, been trying to have sex with a bee. But each time he tries, they die. And so he has to bring in 15 million of them because he knows that this process of trial and error could take a long time. He's trying to find a bee, Rob, that will be able to do the deed with him without dying 
because of the physical impracticality of the act. So what you're saying, Alex, he's trying to c- commit bestiality, be- besti- be- bestiality. Bestiality. Very good, Rob. Yes. Right, Rob. Okay, last story. I said it was going to be COVID-related. I love this story. It's from the Traitorous Guardian um, by Guardian Staff and Agency. So they all got together to do it, Rob. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Wednesday, February the 3rd. I love this story. This might be one that you have. Okay, go ahead. Texas sorry after mistakenly sending emergency alert for cursed Chucky doll. I wasn't going to read the story, but I do have it as a headline and also it was submitted by Kyber. But it is a fantastic story, but uh, it, yeah. It, it really is. The Texas Public Safety Department raised a few eyebrows in the Lone Star State by reportedly sending out an emergency alert asking its citizens to keep an eye out for Chucky the evil-possessed doll from the horror movie series Child's Play, whom it's said was a suspect in a kidnapping. The message was sent out over the state's Amber Alert system, which it blasted to people's mobile phones, usually to help find a missing child. It was sent, Rob, three times. Now, we should just say before we continue the story, you ever seen Chucky? I remember when I was in secondary school, people would talk about Chucky, and it sounded very terrifying, Child's Play, and I don't think I ever saw it because I didn't want to be scared out of my wits. Knowing, Rob, that you are feeble, meek, and easily frightened, I'm imagining that you have not seen it all either. I mean, that's, that's a generalisation, Alex. Uh, I, mean, I haven't, no. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want to either. Will you do something for me, Rob? On the first night in your new house with Sarah, will you sit down and say, we're going to watch Child's Play? No. Alex, maybe when she, what, what, maybe when you brought I, her back from hospital after the birth. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got the perfect film for you, and then just stick about Charles a play on child. with a newborn baby in her arms. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is wrong with me? <laughs> is the question well, she'll anyway. be asking. <laughs> <laughs> it desc- anyway, this Amber Alert described the suspect as being called Chucky and listed him as, to- as a 28 year old with red auburn hair who stood three foot one inch tall and weighed. 16 pounds. He was said to be wearing blue denim overalls with multicolored striped long sleeve shirt and carrying a large knife matching his appearance in the films. His race was listed as other doll. In the movies, which debuted in 1988, Chucky is a child's toy possessed by the spirit of a dead serial killer who murders numerous people. <laughs> Faced with numerous media inquiries as to why an alert was being sent hunting for a cartoonish villain from slasher movie series, the department issued a statement saying, This alert is a result of a test malfunction. We apologise for the confusion this may have caused and we are diligently working to ensure this does not happen again. I accept that. I accept, obviously... Nothing to do with COVID. I don't know why I said it was, but... uh, No. Um, But uh, do you know what? I accept their apology. Right. It was obviously a genuine mistake. But Chucky would have had to have been on the system for that to work in the first place. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So someone has done that. I don't think it was an accident. I'm going to put that out there right now. I, d- I, I agree. Do you think it was somebody who was leaving the job and just decided their last act was going to be to press this <laughs> button and push out this alert? Come on. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob, I also like hunting for a cartoonish villain from a slasher movie series as an episode title. You've got a lot to choose from this week. <laughs> okay, Rob, you've got some stories for us there. Yeah, the first one, I, I'm i not going to dwell on this. I just felt that it's my duty as uh, a reporter. Um, do we call ourselves reporters? As a podcaster reporting on local news. We're ju- Rob, we are journalists. We are Okay, we are journalists. And uh, I, I need to give you an update on this story, which is for some bizarre reason still still dragging on. Um, it's, it was sent in by Amy. Um, it's not a listener story because I, I don't, I'm not going to do the story. I just want to let people know. Um, headline, bodybuilder che- cheats on sex doll wife with bizarre object while she gets repaired. Rob, this is still going on. And sorry, yeah, well, what, he- a bizarre object. So sex doll, bizarre object. What, what could, okay. The mind boggles. Well, according to the Is Daily it a lamppost? No. Well, is it, is it Francis Maud? Is it Francis Maud? Uh, well, amazingly, it's a jerry can. Uh, <laughs> it's not. Is it, um, is it, is it a barrel of 15... 15- 15 million burnt bees. <laughs> no. That's a good episode, Tom. Um, see, surely that's the way to do it. If, if that man wants, wants to have sex with them, she just really pack them in a barrel, really squish them together, and then insert your gentleman's agreement into the barrel. I mean, sure, there's going to be some issues afterwards. You know, you need to 
probably go to hospital and, and get that sorted out. But, you know, he might be into that. Uh, right, so Yuri uh, from Kazakhstan, as, as we know, is married to a sex doll called Mango, um, who, unfortunately, he's married Sorry, to... Sorry, was she called Mango? Well, yeah. Sorry. I don't remember being called Margo. <laughs> she's, she's it's Margo. Her. She's called Margo. <laughs> it's not Mango. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, she's called Margo, not Mango. Um, although, from this point onwards, she's called Mango. Um, so... So in the meantime, he's posted a video on Instagram of himself touching a silver object with small ridges in nothing but his underwear, reports the Daily Star. So there's a video of him lying on a bed, face down with his underwear, caressing what looks like a, a small silver box. Hey, it's, it's not that briefcase, bizarre. is it, that that woman had that sexual attraction to? Do you remember last week you had a story about a woman attracted to a briefcase? I do, yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like it, no. It's a very strange video. Um... And apparently, Sorry, what's um, he called? Yuri, object, so, uh, Mango, there. Margo. So Yuri told his ninety-nine thousand followers, "Looks like I've got a new passion." And one follower replied, "Hey, are you cheating on your wife?" Yuri said, "Maybe." Adding, "I can't stand while she's in hospital." I mean, she's not in hospital. God knows where she is. But uh, right. Um. I think this man, Rob. Sorry, I I went on to another story on the mirror. That's really bad of me. Um, he, I think this man, Rob, is quite clearly an attention seeker. Uh, yeah, I, I would incline to agree. Oh, there's, there's, there's some lovely pictures of him with Margot on a, on a, uh, a beach, which looks like Thailand. Uh, there's another picture of him in the bath with her. Um, and there's a picture of them at the airport. So all, all very, very lovely and, uh, and wholesome. Uh, I'm going to move on to my next story. Can you imagine taking a sex doll onto a, um, onto an airplane? Uh, uh, not personally, no. <laughs> Dragging her to the toilet with you and to join the Mile High Club. I mean, it's, it's quite disturbing. Do you think Would he you, buys her a seat? Do you think he gets her a meal? That's the question. Yeah. Do, I, I, do you reckon, I mean, he must, he must stick her in the overhead locker, which again, I have to stress, is not a euphemism. Can you imagine this image of this man just like, you know that like way you're sort of trying just to... punch her into the locker. <laughs> Get in the locker! I'm sorry, darling. I couldn't afford another seat. Get in there! <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to move on to my next story. Uh, it is from the Metro by uh, Joe Roberts from the 4th of Feb. <laughs> Headline. Man claims he was looking for Saturn's ring while he was caught with his trousers down in lay-by. <laughs> Sorry. That's a euphemism, right? Rob, are you sure it doesn't say Satan's ring? And no, it definitely it, says Saturn's ring. Yeah, Saturn's ring. Rob, I love stories like I love stories like this. What, what was yeah. he doing in yeah, the lay-by again? One. Alex, you'll find out. Oh, okay, yeah. A man has been fined after claiming he drove 300 miles in lockdown to take pictures of planets from Snowden when he was caught with his trousers around his ankles in a North Wales lay-by. So hang on. Whoa. There are so many things going on here. Number one, presumably it was illegal for him to drive to Snowdonia under the current restrictions, Of course, right? yeah. Three, so, let's just pretend trip, yeah. That, so let's just pretend that happened, right? And your excuse is, well, I want to go to the top of Mount Snow- Snowdonia because I happen to get a good view of Saturn, which I believe is complete bollocks. And I, I, I don't think you can get, without a very powerful telescope, any images or, or, or view of its rings, as he puts it. But to, yep. but, but, but to compound his error of having driven to Snowdonia under the restrictions, which is illegal, he's also found in a lay-by with his pants around his ankles, which has nothing to do with, by the way, why Saturn's ring and you looking for that. <laughs> Does it? It has fuck all to do with that. That has to do That's with you stopping for a quick wank. Well, Alex, police were called to reports of two men lying on the ground by the side of the road. <laughs> two men? In Betsa Curry. Two men, yeah. On December 21st. Was one of them called Saturn? Uh, no, no, unfortunately <laughs> not, no. So, I, I'm not entirely sure what's happened here. So, they, so, I mean, just as much as your policeman, you're turning up, you just find that there's two men lying on the ground, who I'm assuming were obviously maybe post-coitus, I'm, I, I would guess, or... I don't know, engage in another act. And his excuse was he'd come this far to take pictures of Saturn. If you'll pardon the expression. Um, do you think that when they, when they looked at his pocket, they said, what's that? And he said, oh, that's just my telescope. <laughs> then he turned around and said, can you see Uranus? <laughs> that joke had to be in there about Uranus. Of course it did with the Saturn reference. Very nice, Rob. Um, what does him lying in a bush with another man in a lay-by have to do with investigating Saturn's rings? Did he, did he, rec- did he claim they were in the bush 
looking <laughs> looking for Saturn's rings. Alex, l- l- let me carry on. Where was this story from? Because I love it. Uh, this was from the Metro uh, initially. I'm not entirely sure where it's been taken from a local paper. Uh, I imagine. I think the, the Metro has a nasty habit of taking it from the Wells online, so there's a good chance that that's did, where it's come did from. Did any listeners submit this as well? No, surprisingly not, no. Okay, okay. Anyway, keep going, sorry. So, when they arrived, Philippe Petrick, 31, tried to remove one of their face masks and asks, do you want to suck my dick? <laughs> Which I'm assuming, I mean, obviously, that, that's sorry, appropriate, so, first sorry, of all. So, say that again. So when they arrived, i.e. the police, he tried to remove one of their face masks and asked, do you want to suck my dick? So the guy said that to a police officer in uniform? Yes, yes. Right, they just thought they'd come along for the party. The Saturn's were in the party. <laughs> Alex, look, you're in a lay-by, you're apparently taking pictures of, of, uh, of Saturn, um, you know, it's obviously a bizarre night to begin with, why not just, you know, hopefully these police officers may get involved? That's not going to sound good in court, though, is it? Uh, no. <laughs> um, he, then, he then proceeded to walk around in just his underwear, ignoring any instructions given to him, slowing his speech, and appearing unsteady. So he was pissed. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Um, he was taken to St. A- St. Asveth, I think, St. Asveth Police Station to sober up, and the following morning said he'd be driven from Southampton two days earlier to go camping and do some photography. So sorry, sorry. Driven from Southampton to Snowdonia. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that about eight, nine hours? Yeah, Alex, I said it's a 300 mile trip to photograph Saturn's rings. What's the problem here? So how did he end up in the bush with the man? Because he, he'd obviously taken, he'd, he'd gone there two days before. He'd obviously taken a holiday. Maybe he'd met a, fo- a fellow photographer. It was a dark night and they just, you know, one thing led to another. He got well, his telescope well, we, we, We've got to bring in the joke again because there's so many opportunities. So one, so he's gone up to Snowdonia. He's taking pictures of Saturn's rings. Another astronomer comes up to him and says, oh, what are you doing? He says, I'm taking pictures of Saturn's rings. And he says, oh, that's amazing. Would you like to see Uranus? Or, or, I'd, like to, or I'd like to see Uranus. And then they go to the bush where that takes place. Uh, uh, <laughs> ironically, uh, that's... From, well, let me read the next sentence. So... Now, the, the, so he obviously ha- has researched this. So the great conjunction with Jupiter and Saturn was taking place during Petrick's planned stay in North Wales. That is true. He would have been able to see you. Ur- <laughs> yeah, he would have been able to see Uranus with an optical aid the night after his arrest if he hadn't been ordered to go back to his home in Southampton. Rob, you couldn't write this. <laughs> so yeah, he could have seen Uranus with an optical aid. Unfortunately, you know, he got caught with his pants down the night before, so only got to see Saturn's rings. Rob, please tell me there's more to this story. What's his explanation for how he ended up in the bush? He, it, there's, there isn't much... He, we don't go into that much detail, unfortunately. So he claimed he did not know what tier his home city was in and he was unaware that travel to Wales had been banned, which is Bollocks. a common excuse. Um, his solicitor, Jamie Gammon... Uh, oh, actually, he is Jamie Gammon. Uh, <laughs> told Flandunno Magistrates Court he had heard about the conjunction of planets and there would be a good view from Snowdonia. He conceded that his behaviour in the lay-by was bizarre, adding that he was seriously embarrassed and regretted what he had done. Um, he so added, do we, do we if, think it was him and another fellow astronomer who decided to celebrate the conjunction of Saturn and uh, Jupiter by having a conjunction all of their own in a bush? <laughs> Uh, yes. I mean, for all we know, you know, maybe they gave themselves the names Saturn and Jupiter, and as you rightly say, have their own conjunction. Yeah. It was a mystical, beautiful experience, Rob. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, he was fined uh, £745 for being drunk and disorderly, and £500 for breaching COVID registration, uh, regulations. Um, yeah. Oh, and, he, and, and as always, he had, to, he had to pay a victim surcharge. Uh, I'm not entirely sure Who was why, the victim? That, why that would apply. Um, the police officer. I mean, you know, he did. He did t- tell a police officer to suck his cock. <laughs> oh, no, and to be fair, he did ask them. So maybe, maybe, maybe the punishment then for breaking COVID restrictions should be that you're strapped to one of Elon Musk's SpaceX rockets on the next test flight. He might enjoy that, Alex. You never know. <laughs> he could. He could be put in there with the man that, that put the, uh, the the courgette down his uh, down his uh, his leggings. And a monkey with a brain chip who can control the aircraft with its mind. Is it just me, or are you also thinking that there's a sitcom pilot in here somewhere? Uh, there's more than that, Rob. There's a whole series. Okay, 
Okay, right. My next story is from the Manchester Evening News. Uh, it is from the 28th of January. It's one of those stories that we've covered them so many times in this podcast that there really should be more details. Right. And it's quite a lengthy headline. So it's by Amy Walker. And the headline is, Disqualified driver caught by police doing Asda shop in second-hand ambulance with emergency lights flashing. Fuck off. <laughs> What do you mean? Where did the fuck do you find a second-hand ambulance number one? Where was it from? Oh, this is in Manchester. These are stories out of the top drawer, Rob, of LA Podcast. I mean, Alex, there's no, there's no indication that he stole the ambulance, so he may, have, he may have brought it legitimately, although he was disqualified, and then drove it to Asda. Yeah. <laughs> With the lights on. Brilliant. It's the first place I'd go, Rob. Oh, absolutely, Alex, yeah. So uh, an ambulance that poured into Asda whilst flashing its emergency lights was poured over by the police and the, dr- the driver was discovered to be banned from driving. Officers in the Harper Hay area saw the occupants th- of the emergency vehicle, including a family, go into the supermarket to do their shopping around 10pm this evening. That was on Wednesday. Um, after being tracked down, police discovered the driver was disqualified from driving and also wanted to be dealt with by a court. Um, the ambulance has since been seized and the driver was arrested. Uh, in a tweet, as they often do, uh, GPM, as in Greater Manchester Police, traffic said the ambulance was reported carrying a family when it arrived at the Asda Harper Hay with blue lights flashing. Uh, <laughs> occupants probably went inside to do their shopping. Rob, how, how irresponsible can you be? First of all, you've been banned by driving. You're not allowed on the road. Second, you think it's appropriate to drive around a second an ambulance. And third, it's illegal to pretend to be a real ambulance in an emergency or to do your Asda shop. Alex, you're being really unfair here. Okay. Did, sorry, didn't the people Look, in Asda think it was odd when an ambulance turned up, sirens blazing, and a family got out and walked in and bought tinned <laughs> a, spam or whatever shop. they bought? <laughs> Gammon. Are, are, you make, are you making the assumption, Alex, that just because the, you know, the, 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 they shop in Asda, this is what they shop for, spam? Yes. I mean, there's possibility. Um, yeah, Alex, you're being unfair. This could be a father who's trying to provide for his family and, and maybe they're in a rush. So he was literally just taking them to do their weekly shop. What's it wrong with that? Rob, where do you buy a second-hand ambulance? Do you literally just go on Auto Trader and put in ambulance? Where do you find that, Rob? I mean, Alex, I don't know. It doesn't say where he got the ambulance from, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't say what the family brought, uh, which I'd also like to know. Um, I imagine that, I, I mean, I imagine if you went onto eBay right now and put in ambulance, something will come up. Okay, let's try it. I'm doing it now. Ambulance. Yep, you're absolutely right. I can buy a proper Renault ambulance for three thousand dollars. I can buy a Mercedes ambulance Sprinter edition. Four thousand. These all look like genuine ambulances. Um, I yeah yeah. There are literally hundreds of listings for second-hand ambulances, complete with all the decals and everything. What? So I yep. About six grand, three grand. There's uh, one here for thirty grand. Uh, sorry, who are buying these these things, Rob? Well, apparently the people of Manchester to do their shopping. Okay, Rob. Now, um, I I have a quick story I want to cover. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm pretty sure when we've spoken before that you have never seen the TV show Breaking Bad. I think I've probably watched. Maybe one, if not two episodes of it. What happened? Why did you not continue with it? I don't know, actually. Um, I might have been the right, the right frame of mind for it. I mean, I enjoyed what I watched, but then just never went back to it. So when you have time, because I think Sarah would enjoy it as well, you know, in terms of having something to fill these sort of COVID nights with, Rob, <coughs> you could watch all five seasons, I think it is, of Bre- or I can't remember now, of Breaking Bad, I think it is. And then a, a prequel to Breaking Bad was made, which is called Better Call Saul, which is all about one of the which characters. Which, again, and all and of them supposed to be very good as well. Well, these are some of the best shows I've ever seen, right? But Saul Goodman is a character we're introduced to in Breaking Bad, who is a lawyer, and who literally is like a lawyer from The Simpsons come to life. Alex, you're, you're talking to me as if I'm an imbecile. I, I know who Saul is. <laughs> yeah, but it's also for our listeners, Rob, who are imbeciles. Um, right, fair Many of them. Um, but the point is Better Call Saul is all about him and we learn actually that Saul Goodman is actually a pretty tragic figure and a more sympathetic figure and a more com- much more complex figure than we realised. The reason I'm saying all this, Rob, is this is a story about 
a real life Saul Goodman. And and when you get around to watching the show, you'll know exactly what I mean in many ways. Although he never did this, it's the kind of thing that you can imagine happening. This is an astonishing story, Rob. So I've got the story as it was covered by Click Orlando, but then I've got the original local news story, which goes into more detail. Great. Um, so this was printed in the or, or in the Click Orlando. So this is in Florida, in the United States, February the second, twenty twenty one. Florida attorney disbarred for making porn film in jail. (laughs) There's a lot to unpick there. So this was in Tampa, Florida. A Florida lawyer has been disbarred for using his attorney privileges to visit women in jail and record sexual encounters with them for a pornographic film, according to the Florida Supreme Court. The state's highest court last week disbarred Tampa attorney Andrew Spark, retroactive to July 2019. According to the Supreme Court, he abused his privilege to practice law. He used his law license to access private rooms provided to attorneys at two jails in order, Rob, to solicit prostitution and record the counters for a pornographic film. That, that, <laughs> that is astonishing. I mean, an amazing abuse of privilege. But <laughs> Right, let's go, to the, so let's go to the original local news story. The Miami Herald, who I think we have reported on before. This is by David J. Neal. Uh, whose headline is Florida attorney caught with a jail inmate and his zipper down is disbarred. So, it's a bit of a strangely written story, but I do want to read it out. In the end, Tampa attorney Andrew Spark's desire to adult play behind bars with a convicted child pornographer cost him his legal career. The 58-year-old has been on probation since February the 8th, 2019, and is scheduled to remain so until February the 7th, 2024, after pleading guilty to charges of bringing contraband into county detention facilities. He's already finished the concurrent one-year probation for misdemeanor solicitation of prostitution. But the actions leading to those convictions and leading to Spark being caught with his zipper open, ready to receive another round of oral sex from an inmate he'd photographed, performing this sex act on him previously, has led to his disbarment. Um, Spark's way of using his attorney privilege to take sexual advantage of women in these county jails was revealed only when he tried to make the same arrangement with someone he met at a porn festival in Tampa. You've got to love this idea of this lawyer. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, on his weekend, what does he do? He goes to a porn... What the fuck is a porn festival? Well, I think I know, but um, nevertheless. So, Shauna Baselli and her husband, Richmond McDonald, made adult films starring Baselli. And they were also awaiting federal court sentencing because of child pornography charges, apparently. Right. On November the 25th, 2017, two days before Baselli would get 40 years in federal prison and McDonald's would get life, so it's pretty serious... Spark visited Baselli. He knew them from meeting the couple at an earlier porn convention. Between them and the prison visit, Spark wanted to shoot some porn with Baselli. But, Galateri said, they couldn't agree on a price. To speak with her on his November 25th, 2017 visit to the jail, Spark flashed his Florida bar identification and acted as if he was Baselli's attorney and was allowed to meet with her. Spark told Pacelli he was making a series of porn videos of female inmates giving him oral sex. <laughs> in return, he put money in their jail commissionary account. He also blagged, bragged he'd done similar videos with another inmate named, in quotes, Rose. <laughs> Pacelli told family members who told law enforcement, and then investigators found Antoinette Rose Napoli- Napolitino, for whom Spark had done pro bono work before her arrest on drug charges. And uh, Spark had also been a sex customer of hers after meeting her through Backpage.com, uh, a dodgy website if ever I've heard one. <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't know. I, I don't know why the, the phrase pro bono in this particular instance seems very fitting. <laughs> it just seems, yeah. So under the guise of official attorney business, he entered a secure, unmonitored attorney-client visitation room with the inmate. Spark used his tablet to record Nap- Napolitino giving him oral sex. Cops convinced Napolitino to be an undercover agent for them. When Spark returned on December the 17th, 2017 to see Napolitino again, he used his Florida bar ID and attorney privileges to take it into the attorney-client room. Spark prepared for the usual arrangement to commence. But after he dropped his trousers, law enforcement entered the room, so they stormed it, arrested Spark, who had a zipper down. After Spark's arrest, they searched his electronic devices with a warrant and found photos of various inmates, a check of jail phone record found a recorded call during which he'd asked, during which someone had asked Spark for money. He said he would, but it'd be an advance against her fee for the first porn shoot. And uh, the next day, a Frankenberg jail record show Spark acted as if he was representing the woman who went into an unmonitored attorney-client room and received oral sex from her while he recorded it with his tablet 
And how much money do you think he put in her account afterwards for that, Rob? Fifty dollars? Ten dollars. Oh, <laughs> Oh, that's so bleak. So not only is he an unethical bastard, he's also very cheap. I do believe, unless I'm getting ahead of myself while I unsheath my purple rod, that it is time for our... Hang on. Uh, Listener story of the week. I was meant to play different notes there, but I believe they all came out the same. Yeah, I, I was about to say, I, I thought that, that missed some notes, but that, that's fine. Where's Alex, your guitar, you know, it's, Rob? Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's packed away, unfortunately, Alex, uh, so I, I, can't, I can't retrieve it. Um, so this week, the listener story is from Amy. Amy uh, in Nottingham. She's Amy in Nottingham. Uh, well, n- near Nottingham. Um, it's, when's it from? Has it got a date on there? Can I see a date? Oh, it's 16th of, 16th of August last year. Uh, and it's from the Japanese Times. Of course it is. I don't know sure we, we featured the Japanese Times before. That seems like a new paper to We me. haven't. We featured the, uh, the, the Tokyo Reporter, of course, a purveyor of uh, salacious news. Uh, but we've never... Yep. So is this from... This is, uh, it's normally Jack that sends us Japanese-themed stories. But now Amy's is. muscling in on his turf. Yeah, and it's a good story as well. So, okay, headline... Chinese restaurant apologizes for weighing customers in campaign against food waste. Right. Uh, I have no idea how this story is going to work, but I'm intrigued. So a restaurant in China has apologized for its controversial controversial policy of asking diners to weigh themselves before entry in an oversized response to a national campaign against food waste. What does weighing yourself have to do with food waste? Like if you're heavy, if you're light, if you're thin, if you're... Bigger? What does that have to do with food waste? You'll find out. So the beef re- uh, it just says the beef restaurant, which I really like. So it's, 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 that's really specific, <laughs> right? So it's just beef, beef. So the beef yeah, restaurant. But Rob, to be yeah. fair, it does what it says. Yeah, yeah, true, true. So the beef restaurant in the city of Shangsha was heavily criticised on Japanese, sorry, Chinese social media as soon as it unveiled the policy on Friday. Customers were asked to stand on scales and scan their data into an app that recommended food choice based on their weight and the dish's calorie value. Oh, I see. What, what, what could be less enticing for you to come into a restaurant than the idea that you're going to be weighed and humiliated in this fashion? <laughs> can you imagine you walk into McDonald's and it's like, you can have a carrot stick, but you're okay, you can have a Big Mac. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, between the two of us, we know who'd be offered the carrot stick and who'd be offered the Big Mac, Rob. Exactly. I've been starving for a long time. Uh, and Alex is a fat bastard. Yeah. Which isn't true. It's not true. But you're not a fat bastard either. I was healthy. just being sort of vaguely humorous and, uh, I guess, slightly unkind for the sake of comedy. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I've put an, I, mean, I have put weight on over... Uh, I was about to ask, have you lost weight or put it on over lockdown? No, I've put on a few pounds. Um, I mean, to be fair, since I bought this second-hand ambulance, we can get to Asda a lot quicker, <laughs> which is really having an impact. <laughs> but the question is, Rob, do you have a fat back? Uh, not as far as I'm aware, no. I've never been told that anyway, which is kind of... I mean, I, not that I'd expect anyone to say... Uh, if, I hope ask I Sarah, saying, ask your wife. Do I have a fat back? Be honest. No, no, she'll, she'll, be, she'll be unkind. Um, so, President Xi Jinping this week urged nations to stop wasting food as the coronavirus pandemic and serious flooding last month has, read to, uh, has led to a rise in food prices. In response, regional catering groups have urged customers to order one few dish than the number of diners at the table and attempt to overturn the ingrained cultural habit of ordering extra food for group meals, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Well, it does, but when you've got the problem of the Uyghur Muslims, you might want to deal with that first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow, cutting satirical humour there. Um, it and when I say the problem of the Uyghur Muslims, I mean the problem of you incarcerating people without... And sort of, you know, genocide, that's the problem. That's what I mean. Not that they're the problem that you should deal with, which is how you said Yeah, them. they're not going to beef restaurants. When, when are we going to deal with China as a world? I mean, why is it that as a, why is it as, a, as, an, as, an, as an earth, as a planet, as a global sort of community, we're always too late to deal with these problems after some atrocity has been committed? And then we look back and say, why didn't we intervene sooner? There, there couldn't be... There's, how much evidence do we need? I don't know what we do, but, but we need to do something. 
Alex, we were about an hour into the podcast and you wanted to start discussing global problems. I mean, I, I think China, yes, it needs to be addressed, but you know, there are, there are literally children starving in the third world uh, and dying of diseases that, that have more or less been cured. Um, and all I'm trying to do is read a story about, about a, a restaurant making quite a serious mistake in regards to their, their, their eating policy. All right. I'll save it for Daft Talk. Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, and, and make sure you find a relevant question because <laughs> there will be one on there. Um, right. In a swift backlash, hashtag related to the incident has been viewed more than 30, oh, bloody hell, 300 million times on the social platform Weibo because obviously China is its own social media because the, the, you know, the, 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 the Democratic Party of China blocks all outside media. I don't so think they're, they're called control. the Democratic Party of China, are they? Aren't they called the Communist Party of China? <laughs> I don't give a shit, Alex. But there's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, good point, actually, yeah. I don't know what, what they're called. People's, I thought people's it was democratic. I thought it, yeah. Anyway, whatever. It is, I think it is, it is communist, isn't it? Yeah, you're right, yeah. Uh, yeah. That party, the ruling party, the only party. <laughs> um, the restaurant said it was deeply sorry for its interpretation of the anti-waste campaign, uh, and then gives a quote. Um, and apparently, or just and then the article finishes by saying, obviously, that there's a, there's a big... Um, social media uh, phenomenon that's happening about binge eating known as mukbang um, which often gets live streamed on various social media platforms so what gets live streamed people binge eating yeah uh, so Chinese state media has also waged war on viral binge eating videos known as mukbang uh, whilst whilst live stream platforms have promised to shut down accounts promoting excessive eating and food wastage Rob I'm just thinking that just for a little bit for a little bit extra for a little bit of extra cash, if you put a camera on you and broadcast it, you know, out to the Chinese, you could get a lot of hits. You know, when you're having your breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I mean, it, it, it's certainly something to consider, Alex. Uh, I think it would be made for very dull viewing. What, are you eating a hundred bags of mini cheddars? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's probably a, a Guinness record in there somewhere. <laughs> All right, is that it, Rob? Yeah, that's that's it for me. Right, well, we, Rob and I will be finishing, as always, on our headlines, which never made it. But before that, Rob, we should just say we're bringing this episode of LA Podcast to a close, episode 332, as we move ever more forward, Rob. Uh, sorry, and we look forward with an extra V grand anticipation, yet trepidation, Rob, to our next episode, which will be episode 333. Wow, what an episode that will be, Rob, as we move ever more forward, like... Um... Like... Uh... Uh, a totally man a to- on a jet ski, a jet ski. <laughs> trying to get his box of yeah, trying to get his box of bees across the Irish Sea. <laughs> oh, what because of that man with the uh, flex doll? Yeah, that, uh, uh, no. What's a, what's a jet ski? Right? <laughs> no, he didn't. No, 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 he didn't have a sex doll. He did, he just crossed he crossed the Irish Sea to get to his his girlfriend on the Isle of Man. She was not a sex doll. But we didn't cover that this week. So why are you referencing the jet ski? You're confusing me. I mean, Alex, it, it, it was only like a No, Rob, weeks ago. we move ever more forward like a totally happy monkey with chips in its brain playing video games whilst being sent into space on a, on, on, at the whim of a lunatic psychopath. Just like that, we move ever more forward to our next episode, which will be, as I say, episode 333. Look, we can be found on our website, lapodcast.net. We're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash lapodcast. We're on Twitter, it's at lapodcast. We are on Spotify. All our episodes are there. Um... You want to send us a story you want to feature on this podcast, please post it on Facebook, tweet it to us at, at LA Podcast, or email us the good old fashioned way, lapodcast.net at gmail.com, lapodcast.net at gmail.com. You can't post it to us as our PO box has been, well, let's just say shut down by the authorities. Um, yeah, raided, s- raided is the word. And seized, Rob. No, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, right, Rob, let's move on to the headlines, which never made it. I have five. I've got four. I will start then. Right. Angry maskless man denied food service returns with a gun to steal fried chicken and waffles. <laughs> uh, we've we've that was, been there. That was Los Angeles there from ABC News. Okay. Um, six arrested after changing Hollywood sign to Holly boob. Uh, eh? <laughs> oh, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. It was very crude. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. From Orlando again. Florida inmate mistakenly... <laughs> Florida inmate re- Florida inmate mistakenly released from jail on his birthday. Authorities are searching for Eduardo Cabana. There's an error on their system that on his, when his birthday came up, they just released him. He's meant to be in jail for a very long, very long time and now they can't find him. So he was just told one day, you're being released. 
So he thought, okay, got his stuff and went. Yeah, makes sense. And he's long gone. Right, okay. Um, so New Zealand sentences cactus smuggler caught with 947 plants strapped to her body. Oh, I had that story and I was going to feature it last week. It was brilliant. Yeah, I thought there was some good detail yeah. in there. But yeah, go check that out. Um, I like this from The Guardian. Bad omen, Tower of London raven missing. Feared dead. I just want to give you a bit of context, Rob. <laughs> One of the ravens at the Tower of London is feared to have died in a potentially gloomy omen for Britain. It means the tower is close to having fewer than six ravens, a level that would spell doom for the kingdom, according to legend. Bloody Brexit. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, you can, but you can just head down to my local Sainsbury's, like I said in our, I think it was Daft Talk, and just pick up some ravens from there. They're all, they're all over the place. Good point, good point. Um, 15 people test positive for virus after attending Kat's birthday party. <laughs> oh, God. What the fuck is wrong with people? Uh, Rob, from The Guardian again. Don't look so dishevelled. Anger over Seoul City's advice to pregnant women. Now, you probably heard about that, didn't you, Rob? No. So it was South Korea. Uh, the Seoul City government sparked anger and fury for offering advice to pregnant women. That includes ensuring their husbands have clean clothes and enough to eat while they're in hospital giving birth. Now, Rob, I want you to go to Sarah with some of this advice, okay? I'm just going to put... Okay. Um, so ahead. in the early st- stages... It suggests that pregnant women avoid putting off the housework as, as doing it will help them maintain a healthy weight. Um, also says, hang the clothes you wore before you were pregnant in a place where they're easy to see as that will motivate you to keep your weight under control and go back to the same weight you were before you gave birth. If you attempted to overeat or skip exercise, take a look at the clothes. Uh, as, as the woman nears her due dates, this might be particularly relevant for your wife, Rob. Women should clear their fridge of items that are about to go off and prepare three to four meals, such as curry and soup, that their husbands, who are unaccustomed to cooking, can simply heat up while they're fending for themselves. They should also make sure they leave enough changes of, clay, of clothes for three days to a week for their husband and children and buy a hairband so that you don't look dishevelled after having the baby. Sorry, I, 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 nor, if this came from North Korea, I could kind of understand, but... Are South Korea still in the 1950s? <laughs> Apparently so, Rob. Right. Okay, uh, last one for me. Uh, <laughs> organ thief, berated mum who left four-year-old boy in car he stole. Uh, not surprised. <laughs> any, any detail on that? No, well, no. Uh, basically, he stole a car and uh, mum had obviously popped in, I think she popped into the shop to get something, left a boy in the car. He stole the car and then, then berated her on social media. <laughs> Because she left the, left the child unaccompanied. Okay, well, last headline. A bit of a follow-up, because you mentioned me mentioning it before as a headline. US judge says parents owe son over trashed porn collection. I don't know if you remember that, but I read as a headline before. A son who was yes, suing... Yeah. Yes, Well, a judge, a US judge in Michigan has ruled that a, 32, a 42-year-old man can seek compensation from his parents for destroying his pornography collection, which he claims is worth over $25,000. Not quite rivaling mine, but nevertheless, a good and tidy sum. Alex, I mean, I hate to say it, but you, your collection is, is is literally worthless. And also heavily stained. Okay. Well, uh, on that lovely note, Rob, uh, we bring this episode to a close. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We're going to be back in a week's time with another episode of Daft Talk. Now, there will be a slight delay to that episode because Rob is in the process of moving. He won't have internet connectivity for a few days, but we, but it will be about, you know, a week and a bit before Daft Talk is out. And then another week after that will be another episode of Local Anesthetic Podcast. God bless. And keep it local. <laughs> <laughs>